and welcome back to the next part of our session on business letter writing. Have you written any business letters since the last time we spoke? I'm sure you have. Probably in emails. And that's good. The more you practice, the better you become. And if you follow the guidelines that we're setting out here in this program, then I'm sure your skills will be much more improved. I'd like to turn the focus now to the style of our writing, the kinds of words, the way we use our words in writing. And to open that subject up, which is a very big subject indeed, let's just take a look at pronouns and active versus passive voice. Personal pronouns, for example, like I, we, and you, these are very important in letters, and they are also very important in memos. They're important, actually, in all the kinds of writing that we do. In these sorts of uh, letters, it's quite okay and quite appropriate to refer to yourself as I and to the reader as you. This is normal, and we do this, and everybody understands this. You do have to be a little bit careful, though, when you use the pronoun we in a business letter, because then it gives the implication that because you're writing it on company stationery, that you're committing your company to what you have written. That when you write we, you're saying we the company, we uh, XYZ company actually are writing this, this letter and committing to what you have written. So it is better when you're stating your opinion in the content of your letters, mostly, to use I. And if for any chance you are talking on behalf of company policy or policy standards or company standards, etc., then you can use the pronoun we. That makes pretty good sense. That makes it very clear to everybody. So this is the best way to use pronouns. And the best letter writers really try to have a style that is very, very clear and that their messages cannot be misunderstood. One way to keep that clear is to minimize your use of the passive voice. We'll go into passive voice a little bit more thoroughly later on. But even though passive voice is sometimes necessary, it can really make your writing style very, very uninteresting. And it also can lead to misunderstandings, or it can lead to people feeling that the letter is not really personal, it's very impersonal. Therefore, it's not really uh, giving a personal touch to the reader. So we have these two points of issue here at first. Pronouns, which ones to use, which ones are better, and also clarity through the use of active or passive voice. I'd like to just give you an example of the same thing said but using passive voice and then using it in the active voice. Let's have a quick look. Passive. This is where the statement is. The net benefits of subsidiary investment were grossly overestimated. So we have the question, who did the overestimating? We don't really know, do we? So here we see that this is not really that clear. If we look at it in the active voice, it says, the global finance team grossly overestimated the net benefits of subsidiary investment. So we have two versions, the passive and the active. Which one is clearer? Of course, we can see that the second version, which is in the active voice, is much clearer. And it is preferable, really, because it's very specific. When using active and passive voice, as you know, because you obviously have studied this in grammar when you've learned English, there are exceptions to rules. In the English language, indeed, there are exceptions to all the rules when studying grammar. 
So, what if you are the head of the global finance team? You may want to get your message across without calling excessive attention to the fact that the error was your team's fault. So by using active voice here, you can see an exception. It does lay blame on the global finance team. It is very specific indeed. So here we can see how the passive voice allows you to, we say, gloss over or to just run over or just briefly uh, mention without really mentioning uh, things that are unflattering or things that are serious points. But you should be careful not to do this a lot. You do need to be specific. So that is something that passive voice can bring, a glossing over of saying who did what. Anyway, this explanation is clear to show you that active really is a more preferable and more specific way to go when you're looking at active voice and grammar. Let's have a look at the next principle in business letter writing. We could say that focus and specificity are integral. That means business writing should be very clear and concise. Now, I have said this in the past and previously to this point. Why have I said it? Because that what, that's what business is really about, being clear and concise in order to get business done well. Do be careful, however, that your document or your letter doesn't turn into an endless series of short, choppy sentences that are concise and specific. You do need to have a flow to things. Try to keep a style about it. And also try to remember that when you are being concise, when you are being brief and to the point, that you don't have to be what we say in English is blunt. Blunt meaning just a bit too hard, a bit too direct, or a little bit cold in what you're saying. Remember, you do need to think about your audience. You do need to think about your reader. And so your tone of voice will be reflected in whether you are blunt and concise. People will catch up on this. They'll, they'll think about this. So let's have a look at the following examples. After carefully reviewing this proposal, we have decided to prioritize other projects this quarter. All right, that is clear. Is it concise? Let's take a look at this. Nobody liked your project idea, so we are not going to give you any funding. Is that clear? Is it concise? Actually, both of these statements are quite concise. The first statement is a weaker statement, though. It's emphasizing facts and not directly relevant to its point. The second statement provides the information simply and in a direct manner. But the directness is too blunt. The first statement is more diplomatic. It has a softer style and it's respectful. Even though it's less concise, it's less clear and to the point as compared with the second version. The second version is a little bit hard and it might get a negative response. It's not very uh, uh, complimentary at all. It's too blunt, it's too in your face, we say, and direct. So here you're trying to say something and the way you say it is very, very important indeed. You do need to be specific, you do need to have focus, but also you don't need to be too blunt unless you want to get a very negative and quick and hard response from the reader. So with business letters, where do you actually begin when it comes to writing them? We've talked about the formatting of your business letter. 
Next, we've talked about the star. We've talked about I, we, and you. We've talked about active and passive voice. We've talked about being concise and being uh, focused and clear. All of these things come into play when we begin to write our letters. So to start to write your letter, the idea is to reread what the description is of the task that you have at hand and the reason why you're writing a letter. Go and familiarize yourself one more time with what your task is. It could be you're applying for a job. You're wanting to uh, write to a company to be uh, employed by that company. Perhaps that is the description of your task that you have to think about. It could be that you are wanting to put forward a proposal submission or whatever it is. You're perhaps writing to your customer to try to influence them in not moving on to another provider. It could be for many reasons that you have this task. So in order to begin the part of writing your letter, familiarize yourself with your task. Think about your purpose and what are the requirements that have been mentioned in that task that you need to focus on. Then the idea would be to list these requirements. This can become your outline. So what are the things you are required to cover in that letter or to meet that task? List them and then they become like a skeleton or a framework and then you can use this to keep you in focus with the details that you have to fill in. Those details will then become thorough and full details. Next up, try to then match up all the things that you're going to use to answer those requirements that you have listed. So you see, you've just started to draw a framework, a skeleton, so to speak. And these steps can really help you start to think about where to begin. Next up, you will have to strive or try very, very hard to be exact and correct and specific with the way that you are putting all the requirements together avoiding all sorts of vague statements and misunderstandings. And if there are any field-specific or industry-specific terminology or concepts that you need to mention in this letter about the task, then you need to convey your competence and your knowledge of that in the body of the letter. Don't look like your uh, incapable of understanding the terminology. You do need to know very carefully what the terminology is. If you don't understand it, then look it up in a dictionary before you even begin to write it or put it in the content of your letter. You may make a mistake, mistake if you don't know the full meaning of words. And don't assume what something might mean. If you don't know it 100%, go and look it up. Check it out with a, a dictionary uh, in your software or use an ordinary dictionary. So therefore, strive to be exact and clear and knowledgeable about the words and the topic that you're writing about. And as we said earlier, don't use any language that your audience may not understand. This is extremely important and something you need to definitely focus on. When you come to your finished piece of writing, this finished document should be able to indicate how you have answered all the requirements that you've listed. Just go through it and read it and then tick off the requirements that were listed in your framework. If you have any questions, then you know that you haven't covered something very well. So if you haven't been able to tick things off, then you need to rethink and relook at the content of your letter. So here we do have a simple framework of where to begin. Reread, think about your purpose, 
list your requirements. Next, identify what you need to include to match the requirements. Strive to be exact in every way, specific and use the language of the reader. And with your finished product, go back and check off. Tick off whether you've matched all the requirements that you listed in the skeleton framework you drew up. I'm sure if you use these simple guidelines, then that will help you to know where to begin. This is very, very important. And it will make you feel uh, very, very uh, satisfied about the whole process and confident as well. Remember we talked about passive voice. We touched on it quite briefly. This really does seem to be one of the most difficult things for people to understand when they're writing letters. And I'd like to touch on it in a little bit more detail so that you can become more familiar with when to use it and why indeed uh, it does cause problems. There are many myths about passive voice. Let's have a look at some common myths about use of this voice in letter writing. Some people think that the use of passive voice means that it's a grammatical error. It really is not a mistake in grammar. It's the style of it that sometimes makes it difficult for things to be clear. That means that there are times when using the passive voice that the reader cannot really understand what you are saying. We highlighted that just very briefly before when we looked at the previous example. So bear this in mind when you are writing. You do need to be very clear. And this is why we're discussing passive voice and active voice in letter writing in more detail. So passive voice is not really an error. However, its style does make things unclear. Another myth, any use of to be in any form constitutes the path passive voice. This is not so true. Any passive voice entails more than just using the verb to be. Using to be, of course, can make the impact of your writing a little bit weak. But it is sometimes necessary and does not by itself constitute passive voice. Myth number three, the passive voice always avoids the first person. If something is in first person, that is I or we, it's also in the active voice. That is not true. On the contrary, you can very easily use passive voice in the first person. And here's a very good example. I was hit by the dodgeball. So we can use the first person pronouns in passive voice. Another myth. You should never use the passive voice. Even though, and let me state this very clearly, even though passive voice can weaken the clarity of your writing, there are times when it is quite all right, it's quite okay to use passive voice, and it might even be preferable. So let's just remember these points as we go through passive voice. Myth number five. I can rely on my grammar checker to catch the passive voice. Well, see myth number one. Passive voice is not actually grammatically incorrect. So therefore, grammar checkers really are not only, are not going to pick this up in entirety. They might pick up a little bit about it, but it's not always caught. So don't think that using a grammar checker is going to catch you and see your mistakes before you send out a letter. You really have to get to understand passive voice more thoroughly to do that. So, do these sorts of misunderstandings sound familiar to you? Many people think these things. So we are going to discuss here when you should avoid passive voice and also when it's okay. So this is an important thing that you will need to understand about passive voice. So you can be sure that the letters you send out are not going to sound ambiguous or unclear or ridiculous or 
uh, not specific enough and to the point. So let's look at a de definition of passive voice. The passive voice occurs when you make the object of an action into the subject of a sentence. That is, whoever or whatever is performing the action is not the grammatical subject of the sentence. Take a look at this rephrasing of a familiar joke. We all know the joke. Why, was the, why did the chicken cross the road? Well, this is termed in the passive voice. Why was the road crossed by the chicken? Who is doing the action in this sentence? The chicken is the one who is crossing the road. But the chicken is not in the spot where you would expect it to be in grammar. Instead, the road is the grammatical subject. The more familiar phrasing of this, as I said, why did the chicken cross the road, puts the chicken in the subject position, the position of doing something. The chicken is the actor, the chicken is the doer, and the chicken crosses the road, the road is the object. We use active verbs or doing verbs to represent the actor, whether it is crossing roads, or whether it is proposing ideas, or making arguments, etc. We use active verbs as the doing verbs. So once you know what to look for, passive constructions or passive sentences are very easy to see. Look for a form of the to be verb, is, am, are, was, were, his, etc. Followed by a past participle. And usually the past participle is in the ed forming the end. So there are exceptions, however. For example, like the word pay, P-A-I-D, it's not P-A-Y-E-D. And driven, it's not drived. So here's just a formula that can help you identify passive and identify whether you've put something in the passive voice and it's not very, very clear. You have the form of to be plus the past participle equals passive voice. That's it in a nutshell. Let's briefly take a look at these two sentences that have just been read or that you can read. And let's look at how to change passive into active construction. You can usually just switch the word order, making the actor and subject one by putting the actor up front. For example, the metropolis has been scorched by the dragon's flaming breath becomes the dragon scorched the metropolis with his flaming breath. Simple, isn't it? That is now in active voice. The next example, when her house was destroyed, Penelope had to think of ways to delay her remarriage. Becomes, after the fire destroyed her house, Penelope had to think of ways to delay her remarriage. That has now become the active voice. So, to repeat myself and to make it clear, the key to finding out whether passive voice is used is to look for both a form of to be and the past participle, which usually but not always ends in ed. This is the standard rule. So does that make things clearer about passive voice? Well, the primary reason why your readers really do look down upon passive voice, they frown upon it actually, which means that they don't really like it so much, is that they often have to guess what you mean. Sometimes the confusion might be major confusion, it may only just be minor confusion. So they can just guess or they can estimate who is doing the acting or what you're actually meaning. If we look at the phrase again, when her house was destroyed, Penelope had to think of ways to delay her marriage. Just like many other passive constructions, this sentence is not very explicit and it does not refer to the actor. It doesn't tell you who or what destroyed Penelope's house, does it? So you're missing out on part of the meaning. You're missing out on the full meaning, the entire meaning 
of what happened. That is where the active voice really clarifies things. The active voice says, after fire destroyed Penelope's house, she had to think of ways to rebuild. After fire destroyed Penelope's house, she had to think of ways to delay her remarriage. So there is a very big difference. Active voice gives you much more clarity. That was a very silly thing perhaps to be talking about, a simple example, and it really does just make very clear, however, that active voice has much more clarity to it. Can you understand that point? Can you see that? So many readers who are trying to make sense of your writing really do prefer that you use the active voice. I said earlier that they frown upon, meaning they don't like very much the fact that you might use passive voice. They want you to specify who or what is doing the action. That is the key point for them. Let's compare the following two examples as well to see if you can agree. Here we can see passive. A new system of drug control laws was set up and in brackets we see by whom. We don't know who set it up. Active voice says the Australian government set up a new system of drug control laws. Very clear, isn't it? Which one is clearer? The active. Here's another example. And this lacks precision that can accompany the passive voice. Lacks clarity. Gender training was conducted in six towns, thus affecting social relationships. And a few pages later in the document it said, plus marketing links were being established. This is another area where passive voice really does confuse things. In both paragraphs, the writer never specifies the actors of doing those actions. Who did the gender training? Who established marketing links? If you take a look back, there's no way of knowing that. And therefore, the reader has trouble, just like you did and just like I did, in understanding exactly what was going on, the dynamics of these social interactions. It was very difficult to understand. And so this is where passive voice, as I said, does create problems. It does create ambiguity. And that's why people really don't like it, because it's not very clear. The actors really do, in active voice, make things much more specific. So it pays for you as a writer of business letters to remember this in every letter that you write. So let's take a look at active, passive voice and summing it up, the thing is don't be lazy in thinking and writing. What we've gone through just in the previous section, you should also know that some people say that the passive voice signals sloppy and let's say lazy thinking. It may not be that you're lazy, but it actually comes across when you use passive voice. People say that when writers who overuse the passive voice have not fully thought through what they are discussing, that this makes for imprecise arguments. This makes for uh, cases or arguments that are not really precise and clear. So a lot of people do say this about passive voice and it's something that you do need to perhaps think about and remind yourself when you are writing. So can you see this point? Is it clear in your mind? Hopefully it is. Because passive voice and active voice, as I said, are very, very important parts of the business writing proposal. So let's move a little bit towards active thinking and writing. We know what is important in styles now. We know the importance of writing. And we know the importance 
of making sure that the reader understands clearly what we are doing. We encourage you to keep all of these tips actually in uh, the program that we've done. Keep them in mind as you revise and you may be able to put into practice this advice as you write your first draft. You may think, oh that's difficult, I'm not going to be able to do that straight away, but you might surprise yourself. You have had experience and you are in business and even if you have a lot of experience in writing letters in your own native tongue, uh, perhaps English might be a little bit more difficult for you, but practice it until you become perfect. The more you try and the more you get people to proofread and help you also with your grammar, then the better you will be. There are certain parts of grammar that are difficult and also sometimes passive is one of the most difficult things, passive and active voice, for learners of another language to understand, particularly the English language. Do look for things though when you revise. It's important that you revise as you are preparing things, as, I, as you are putting the uh, content of your letter into place. Make choices about what is proper and where they should go. And do remember, if you do slip into passive voice, there's nothing grammatically wrong about it. The key is to recognize when you should use it and when you shouldn't and these choices are really yours. Always try to look for the actor. Always try to look for the doer. And if you can't find them, then you don't have active voice. That is just the basic guideline that you can follow. So let's take another look now at letter writing. And we're going to also start off with cover letter writing. Not only do you have to write full business letters, but also you do need to write cover letters. And cover letters really take the format of being brief and they are a one page document that goes off with your other documents to the reader. For example, and a simple example is if you are writing a job proposal, if you are writing a job application and you want to send it off to a prospective employer. It means that you have to, instead of just sending that application in an envelope without any information to the reader, you need to write a cover letter which presents yourself to that potential employer and it basically introduces yourself so that it shows you are interested in why you should be a good fit for their company. Basically this is that example. If you send that application form off to that person without any cover letter, it looks as though you are not being professional about what you're doing. It looks as though you've forgotten to include that cover letter because people really do expect it. It's nice to get that short introduction when you receive something in the mail as well with a brief cover letter just introducing the enclosures or the main letter. So do think of these things. Cover letter writing is important. And actually the cover letter format can be almost identical to the regular business letter format. Remember the previous examples that we went through. So it's not really a difficult thing to write. People tend not to write them because they're lazy. They tend to think, oh it won't matter, uh, they'll understand what I'm talking about when they open up the document. Well really, if you want to make a very good professional image for yourself or for your company, no matter what you're writing about, then you do need to enclose a cover letter. It's very, very important and you should put it on your letterhead with some indication of who you are or your company. 
a statement of your company and their address, etc. So generally, the cover letter will consist of three paragraphs. The first one is an opening paragraph, which is an introduction to yourself. For example, if we look at the job application, which is a simple one to be looking at. Here you would include information on the position that you are looking for and how you heard about it and why you are interested in that position or the company. That's just a simple statement that you open up with in your first paragraph. And keep to those simple points. The second paragraph should provide a little bit more about you in that particular example of wanting to apply for a job. It should indicate your skill, your strengths, your education, qualifications and perhaps some experience about yourself. Here, this should be concise. You don't need to go on in a long, uh, rambling way because you actually have included your resume with those particular details. But this paragraph should be uh, specific and you might just to want to highlight in this paragraph why you are the ideal candidate. You don't have to talk about all the things in your resume, but maybe highlight one of the points as to why you think you are a very good candidate for this particular position. So this would be your second paragraph. And thirdly, the third paragraph. This should close up your cover letter by requesting an interview. Remember we're in the job application example. So here you would request an interview and possibly suggest times that are convenient and convenient for the employer. In this third paragraph too, you can let the employer know the best way to contact you and give your contact and email and phone details so that they can contact you in whichever the best way is. So this, in the final paragraph, is how you close up your letter. And therefore you should also thank them and then finish off with your signing off. Sincerely yours and then your name, etc. So this is just a basic cover letter. One, two, three paragraphs. Thank them and then sign off. Now do remember, even though it's only a cover letter to something, it still has importance. It still should be unique to your particular issue and tailored to the specific company and also the position in this particular example that you are applying for. Using a one-size-fits-all cover letter really makes it look very, very standard. And it may not be appropriate. You may put something in that one-size-fits-all that is not unique to who you're writing to. And therefore, they can see that and it looks like you've just cut and pasted information and not really thought about the content of your cover letter. So do be careful there. Really read through. Make sure everything is unique to whom you are writing to. And that way you look much more professional. Whether you're applying for a job, whether you're sending some information out to a customer and you're attaching a cover letter, whatever the situation is, you have to be specific and clear just as much in a cover letter as you would be in a formal business letter. Also, you do need to be careful to check for grammar and spelling. Even though the letter is brief, you still may make mistakes. And the very important thing about a cover letter, of course, it should not be longer than one page in length. Otherwise, it is really not a cover letter. So keep it to an A4 page in length. And try to follow the general rule that three paragraphs is enough. You don't need to go over that because most of the information is contained in the body of the content you are attaching. So that really does sum up cover letters. 
we can look at cover letters as being a very important part of our business letter writing process. So do remember that. And do remember that people really regard the kind of person you are just from how you write. It doesn't matter what format you're writing in. They will think of who you are purely because of how they see your writing and how your image is reflected. Here we can see a sample of a cover letter. The cover letter is addressed at the top with your address. And then we have the standard format, the date and the person to whom this cover letter is going, their address, and then their name, the salutation. Dear Mr. Black. It says with great interest I'm applying for the position of Chief Accountant. In the first part, it's introducing this person. It says when I read the job description in your ad in the New York Times on such and such a date, here are the specifics. I felt that it was an ideal match for my career hopes, my career aspirations. I have always wanted to work for a Fortune 500 company such as Global Answers. So here we see the first introductory paragraph. It is introducing the writer and it is being specific about who they are, what they want and why they're writing to this company. The second paragraph, as we said, is now talking about experience, etc., but in a highlighting style. The writer says, I believe I am the ideal candidate due to my extensive experience as an auditor for KPMG. He then goes on to talk a little bit about his position there. He performs all the same tasks that are described in your ad. And then he adds onto that that he has a reputation for being a very hard worker. These are some specifics about him. A hard worker who does work very well and his reports are always completed well, etc., etc. So here he has highlighted some specific points about his ability. This is the second paragraph. Thirdly, we come to the last paragraph, and here is the closing. Here he is saying specifically that he would like the uh, reader to contact him, set up an interview at the earliest convenience of the reader. This is very nice writing, at your earliest convenience. This is very nice English writing, and very polite indeed, and very professional. It says here that you can reach me by way of email at such and such or phone on this number. And in signing off, in leaving the reader, he says that he looks forward to discussing this and his future with the company. And he writes in here, instead of saying with you, he says with Global Answers, the name of the company that he's writing to. So he's being very specific and emphasizing the company name. Then he signs off with thank you for your time and consideration. Sincerely, Ken Jacobs. And at the bottom, as you can see, enclosure is the resume. So here, the format is flush to the left. Here, the format is following the your address at the top, then going through all the parts of the components of the letter that we went through previously in our session. It talks about Mr. Black. His surname is Black, so therefore this is a very polite uh, salutation. And it's correct. The introductions, the body of the cover letter, and the closing of the cover letter are all fitted into an A4 page. We can see that the writer has not rambled on, the writer has not added this and gone on unnecessarily about all of these points. That is left up to the body of the resume, the enclosure that he is attaching. Here he is using I. Here he is also using you. He is using active voice in this letter and therefore it is very, very clear indeed. 
So I would like to remind you of the very important parts that we can see that come with business writing. We have touched on in our program so far this standard business letter, the format of a standard business letter. And we have touched upon some of the other points of style and the elements that are important in writing. In this particular session that we've just run through now, we have also looked at active and passive voice and certain other areas regarding pronouns and being clear and focused and specific in letters. So as you begin to write your letters, it's important that you realize how you develop a style does really also reflect upon the reader. So please proceed carefully and please ensure that when you do finish every letter, whether it's a formal business letter, whether it's an email, whether it's a cover letter that we have uh, gone through in this session, please ensure that you proofread. Everything should be proofread, proofread thoroughly. And that way you can be guaranteed that you're reflecting a professional image about yourself. I do hope these guidelines are helping you along the way to becoming much, much better at your letter writing. Thank you for your kind attention.